On that uh, topic of, of cover-ups, I wanted to bring up a, a story. This is a, is a man, Adrian Schoolcraft. Uh, just a little bit of background on him. So he's a police officer in the uh, 2000s. Is uh, definitely a uh, very like patriotic and by, by all amounts a good guy. He joined the NYPD shortly after the 9-11 attacks. Uh, basically feeling a patriotic drive. He went through the police academy, became a police officer, was assigned to a precinct, and worked in patrol for many years. Uh, he was later, after what we were going to talk about happened to him, went down, he, he expressed that as a police officer, he uh, felt that, you know, he took his job very seriously. He was very serious in, in this kind of sense of personal justice. So yeah, in the um, in the 90s, uh, following off of the, the 80s and the kind of uh, you know, crime wave that you might describe that New York was having in the 70s and 80s, you had a big push into this system called CompStat. So CompStat, which is still being used today uh, in New York, is a crime uh, measure tracking system. So basically it's the, that are- uh, They're trying to put these statistical models to to law enforcement. Right. And so it's the NYPD year by year tracking crime. And so similar to how corporations, they're always wanting to see a profit margin and they will do anything within that quarter to get that profit margin just a little bit better. Yeah, a better quarter, yeah. And it has to be better every single quarter. The same concept happened with the NYPD and CompStat. There was a, a drastic pressure on the brass and the police department, the commanding officers, that every single year those CompStat numbers had to be going down and the arrests and enforcement had to be going up to look like the NYPD was doing a really, really good job at keeping crime down and keeping, um, you know, criminals locked up. And so what happened to, what, what started to happen is people, um, after just witnessing the NYPD and how they do operations, became suspicious that there were quotas going on. Uh, quotas being that commanding officers were telling the rank and file officers on the streets that you need to be going out and making a certain amount of arrests. So uh, Adrian Schoolcraft basically found that that was what was happening. And so he, with his feeling that as a police officer, it was his duty not only to police the public, but to police the police, decided to start to put a wire on himself, put a, put a recording system under his uniform, and he started uh, recording. And, and he got a lot of recordings of police officers, police commanders, actually going in and telling these officers, like, yeah, you need to make this amount of, of, of speeding tickets today, this amount of that, this amount of crimes. And they would berate them. Right. And uh, at, at some point, uh, Schoolcraft was was, was uh, figured out. Uh, there's actually lots of... of um, videos of, of you know police commanders sitting down and talking to them and very much that um, in law enforcement you call the blue wall of silence that that's the thing that basically when it comes to accusing other police officers or if a police officer sees a police officer do some, another police officer do something improper you don't talk and so they started giving him really um, bad assignments you know putting putting him on weird hours trying to encourage him to not do this thing uh, until at, at one point uh, essentially, he was in a fight with with a sergeant. He was like, "Oh, I'm gonna go home sick." He goes home sick, and this is all recorded. The police department comes to his home. Uh, they they force their way in, and basically tell tell Adrian that he told that his uh, his police commander that he was gonna harm himself, and they uh, said so that he was an emotionally disturbed person. That's e- what they claimed. Yeah, and EDP EDP is a term that that NYPD uses some police departments for emotionally disturbed person. And so essentially, what they do is they they take him and they relieve him of his duty. He's suspended as a police officer and he was placed in a mental health facility not only is he basically arbitrarily jailed uh but but basically just just held away as a matter of fact the only reason why we even even know that that he came out of this facility is his father who hadn't heard from him. his father lived in upstate new york hadn't heard from adrian in in, in a while in, in weeks and months and uh, started calling around hospitals and after after being able to, to call enough of those, he found out where his son was. They got him out. Uh, recently, Adrian actually uh, won an almost million dollar award from the city for false imprisonment. Uh, he no longer works as a police officer and, and actually um, has never really re- never really recovered his life in the same way. I believe he's still uh, he's living with his father in upstate New York and, and has some issues, you know, surrounding what happened to him. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good That's example a- of when somebody who is inside that power uh, starts to speak out against that power, how they will be erased, and any they will be shunned down, othered, and basically their their voice will be censored and, and covered or disappeared and, and disappeared. Yes, and it makes me think of Assange. Yeah, I and mean, it's you know what what they do to whistleblowers. Definitely. Speaking of NYPD, 
we had a, um, a case uh, pretty recently about NYPD secretly collecting the, the DNA from thousands of New Yorkers. And, you know, this was just a thing they were doing. Yes. <laughs> and it, it reminds me of, it's kind of a cliche in some of the, the movies of how they'll um, give the bad guy a cup of coffee or a cigarette and then afterwards, they, they get the DNA off of it. And, you know, you see that in a movie and you think that's, you know, a bit much. Well, I mean, they were they were really doing it. <laughs> and they were keeping this, this, this database. I'm just putting it into the database and using the database. And this is why it's, you know, transparency is so important. Regulation is so important. And whistleblowers <laughs> are hugely important because they're, you know, they're a big part of that. The story that, um, that's been around there recently that I also wanted to hit was this supposed kidnap plot against um, the Michigan governor, uh, Whitmer. Just about at the time we're recording this, the jury came in on that and, and there were four guys that were being accused and uh, two of them were acquitted and there was a hung jury for the other two. And this was supposed to be a big highlighted huge case against the dangerous, scary, white supremacist faction out there. and. You know, and, and what you had in this case was really similar to what you saw after 9-11, uh, where, you know, there's frankly not really much happening out there as far as, you know, Muslims in, in, in the U.S. planning attacks and whatnot. So the FBI and Homeland Security need to justify their, those budgets and keep those budgets increasing so they would infiltrate these groups and their, their infiltrators don't just go in and listen, but they go in and encourage the plots and sometimes they even bring in money. And, it, and, and it's clear that's what, what happened in this case. And that's why they, they couldn't get a conviction in what was supposed to, be, supposed to be an easy case because they basically find these guys that are frankly kind of doofuses that are easily led. When you rile them up and you say, we're going to you know do this thing in this plot. And you know maybe these are guys who, who should have maybe had some kind of enforcement for this idea that basically th none of this happens if the FBI... And the and their guys aren't in there planning it and making it happen. Where this kind of ties into censorship is you have you had a spokesman for for Whitmer, the governor, coming out with this wonderful quote: "The plot to kidnap and kill a governor may seem like an anomaly, but we must be honest about what it really is: the result of violent, divisive rhetoric that is all too common across our country." There must be accountability and consequences for those who commit heinous crimes. Without accountability, extremists will be emboldened. And you just have the you know the real focus in there on on rhetoric. You know we have this violent, divisive rhetoric, and so what are we got to do about it? Well, of course you have to censor. You know that's really kind of what I took away from there as as the real connection in this whole thing.